Praise God. How many are blessed? My, my, my. How many are excited? How many enjoyed last night? Amen. Hallelujah. If you're watching online, you can share the broadcast. I know that um, we've been having uh, many people from around the world which uh, watching, and it's, it's awesome to be able to connect through the Internet because you can have people that are um, all over the world watching in the continent of Africa, watching in Asia, watching in South America even, and uh, God can touch them. Isn't that awesome that technology has given us the ability to reach beyond the four walls of the church and into the nations of the world? And um, we're entering into fantastic days. And I believe that the things even that we touched on last night, we started to experience God's goodness, His presence, His power last night. I think it's just a foretaste of what we're going to be seeing this year. And, um, you know, how many know Lou Engle? Anybody know Lou Engle? Um, Lou Engle, somebody sent me um, a message of his recently. I, I've been going over it because there's some prophetic implications that uh, of some of the things that he spoke about uh, in his message uh, that I've been pondering uh, recently, but one of the one of the because th- I had a dream about him in a connection um, with a door of hope that God was going to open for America. And uh, one of the things that Lou said w- in this message was that um, oftentimes God brings revival uh, through a Bethlehem, the most unlikely places. Even the in the, even the confined the small places where people don't don't think not the big cities not Jerusalem, he said. But it's often Bethlehem that God begins to bring the move of God, and I believe that we're going to begin to see that in this hour, where there are places where uh, God is going to break in cities of revival, Bethlehem's all across America, where the presence of God is going to be. And they're going to be in communities. They're going to be towns like this. You know, I live in a town. I don't know how many people are here, like, in this city. But my city, Moravian Falls, I don't even think we have 3,000 people there. I mean, it's that small. But when the Lord calls you somewhere, tells you to go there, you just go because God tells you. And we've been experiencing, I think, some of the greatest... um, moves of the Holy Ghost, especially like just recently we had our our conference, and on the Saturday afternoon, the presence of God was so thick, my the speaker couldn't even get up and talk. I mean, it was just, were you you there, Matt? I mean, it was that, it was that wild, people were just touched by the presence of God, and we're actually still getting testimonies from that. And it's really about cultivating um, what God is doing. Touch your neighbor and say, it's time to cultivate the presence. So we've been talking about the sevenfold glory. We talked about that Friday night. If you were here, how many were here on Friday night? Okay, how many were not here on Friday night? Oh, you're going to have to go back and listen to that. Talked about the sevenfold glory because that is what God is bringing in the earth right now. He is bringing the sevenfold glory or the entire menorah. He's lighting up the menorah. He's releasing fresh oil in this hour for his bride. And there's a separation that's happening. And there is a justification that God is going to bring to his bride in this hour, even of uh, false religious accusations, as well as demonic uh, um, uh, manifestations where the enemy has tried to come in and, and bring accusation against the bride. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Zechariah. We're looking at Zechariah. I want to start um, from Zechariah 3. And we're gonna we're kind of gonna launch from here, and then we'll see where we land, where the Holy Ghost has us. But Zechariah, th- verse eight says, "Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men who uh, wandered at." For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Obviously, we know he's talking about Jesus here. 
For behold, the stone that I will lay before thee upon one stone shall there be seven eyes. Say seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. This is a powerful um, prophetic word that was given to the prophet Zechariah specifically concerning uh, the bride of Christ and the accusations that the enemy would attempt to bring against the bride. But the Lord said that he would give a stone, say a stone, with seven eyes upon it. Those seven eyes represent the completeness of the Spirit and actually the fullness of the Spirit or the Spirit without measure in which Jesus operated in. Jesus didn't have the Spirit by portion. He had the Spirit without measure. That means that there wasn't one thing that wasn't available to Jesus, that he had the fullness of the measure of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus came as a representation, really as a manifestation of what the new creation man looks like. And became the vicarious sacrifice for all of humanity. Therefore, giving us the opportunity as humans to receive what he stepped in the gap for you and I for. So that we could in turn live a life without measure. Touch your neighbor and say, you're not called to live in limitations. You're quiet this morning. Say, you're not called to live in limitations. There you go. I'm a little Pentecostal, so you're going to have to get with me this morning. You're not called to live in limitations. You're called to live in unlimited power. Just tell your neighbor that right now. So, the, so Zechariah is seeing what is going to happen in the end times. And in that, God is going to bring his bride and has brought his bride into a place of justification. He has given unto him, them a stone. That stone has seven eyes upon it, which is the fullness of the Spirit. And in ancient times, you have to understand that Zechariah was seeing something prophetically, but he also understood, in a sense, what he was seeing. You know, many, you know, in charismatic worlds, we think that God is going to speak to us in a language that uh, we don't understand. And we think that God's going to show us something crazy that is like out of the box and we don't know what he's saying. That's not the way the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit will often use things that you understand as symbolization to speak to you a word so that it will strengthen you, encourage you, and build you up. That's what prophecy is. That's why if somebody comes up to you and gives you a weird word and you go, I don't even know what they're talking about. Have you seen that meme with the guy from uh, Nacho Libre where it says, like, I received a prophetic word and the person's and he's like looking like what, like. You know, what is this? Have you ever had somebody come to you and just give you the weirdest word in the world and you're like, I don't know what they're even talking about. Just wave at me if you've ever had that before. Yeah, that's called, that's called, that's goofy. And we're going, what are they even talking about? You know? God doesn't operate that way. God operates in the way that he will speak through the Holy Spirit to you and he will give you images and even pictorial pictures in your spirit, man. If it's not an open vision, he'll give you a pictorial vision in your spirit and you'll understand what he's saying to you. He's not going to give you something where you're like, what is what is in the world is this? Zechariah understood what that stone meant with the seven eyes on it, because during ancient times, 
when you would go before the court system in order to be acquitted there were either a white stone or a black stone those stones represented either your uh your uh condemnation your 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 um your your uh guilty verdict or it would represent your uh your acquittal the stone that Jer that Zechariah saw was a white stone and that stone represented the acquittal or the release of the accusation of the enemy upon the sin. And so he sees this stone with seven eyes, which is the fullness of the spirit. He sees Joshua, which is a representation of the Christ. Because, you know, in, in um, Hebrew, Joshua actually means Jesus. And he sees this branch that's going to be, uh, that's going to spring forth. And there's going to be a stone that's given that has seven eyes upon it. That is going to, as, as it is given, it is going to remove the iniquity of the land. And the Lord is going to, in that day, say, that's this day. Oh, my goodness. You say, that's this day. Yeah, that's this day. God says that I'm going to remove the iniquity of the land. And I am going to allow my people to rest underneath that vine. And I'm going to give them a tree that they can rest under. That tree is the cross. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad for the cross? The, 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 you can come underneath the cross and you can live in that place. And the Lord says that every man and his neighbor shall come underneath the vine. We know that Jesus is the vine and that fig tree represents that cross of Calvary that Jesus paid the full price of sin for you and I. And so now as believers, we are able to be justified as if we have never sinned. To walk righteously and as believers stand in the gap to see iniquity removed from our own land and demonic powers that rest over our regions come into subjection where they are no longer in, uh, empowered but they are dismantled and then the throne of the Lord can be set in a region so that the kingdom of God can be advanced. That's what God has called us to. Say that's what God's called me to. So he sees the stone that's given that is a sign of acquittal, a sign of justification, a sign of everything that has been committed previously has been removed and you are now free to live. Man was underneath, you and I were underneath a curse of sin hell and the grave jesus came stood in the gap released the fruit of sacrifice to the father for our sins so that we could now be justified through faith and live a life that is full of god and we would be not only uh, uh sinners saved by grace but that we would be justified to live just as if we've never sinned in the righteousness of god and and the righteousness of god begin to rightly divide the word rightly live our lives according to that word of God and walk in the fullness of everything that God has called you to do. When we are living that life as new believers, we're not, you know, it's like people get saved and they just, it's like, well, I'm just saved now. No, when you get saved, you're a new creation, you're a new believer, and there are things that God wants to begin to produce out of you that are going to bring life and life more abundantly. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. You're preaching good this morning, brother. Charlie Champ, I thank you that you're setting me free this morning. Just hallelujah. So there are things that God wants us to do. And when we begin uh, to, to, to begin to move into these things, we are going to begin to experience those seven radiations of God's spirit. We're going to begin to see the full aspect, the seven eyes of the Lord, because the Bible says that the eyes of the Lord look to and fro throughout the entire earth who, and so that he can show himself strong in someone. God wants to show his strength in you. 
You may not feel like it this morning. You might feel weak. You might feel weary. But I'm telling you right now, God wants to encourage you. He wants to strengthen you. He wants to reinforce you for this year. And nothing will catch you off guard because you're not just seeing through the eyes of the natural, but you're seeing through the eyes of the spirit. And that seven, that seven eye revelation is the full aspect of the Holy Spirit so that there's nothing that you miss. There's nothing that you don't capture. You see everything that God God is saying all the time, and God begins to release the, the sevenfold, uh, Isaiah 11, the sevenfold uh, uh, manifestation of the Holy Spirit through our life so that and whenever we come into a conflict with the enemy, we have an answer. So there are some things that we can do in order to position ourselves to begin to walk in the fullness of God's presence. Firstly, the thing that we need to do is cry out for the fire of God. You say, well, Brother Charlie, I cried out for the fire of God back in 1987. And I was baptized in the Holy Spirit of Spoken Tongues at the, you know, at the, uh, the Assembly of God Church. I'm Assembly of God. I grew up Assembly of God, so it's okay. Uh, you know, I, I, I went to the Assembly of God in 1987. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. I ran around the church three times, and that was it. Well, my friend, i got to ask you this morning, are you filled with the Spirit afresh? I like what Bill Johnson says. You know, we get filled with the Spirit, but some of us leak. And we got to be filled with fresh fire. Say fresh fire. And we got to cry out for the fire. There has to be a desperation, a hunger in your spirit to go after the things of God. I'll tell you, I've been serving God for 20 years, well, actually longer than 20 years, and God saved me out of a lot of things, and I'm grateful for that. And I look back when I was 18 years old, and I got set on fire for Him, and I started moving into the things of God. But every time, the Lord would always push me into the next place and say, are you satisfied with where you're at, or are you hungry for more? Because I'm telling you that there's an unlimited spirit, there's an unlimited power, and God doesn't run out of his presence. In fact, God has more than enough. Come on, somebody. I feel it this morning. There's a lot of glory that God wants to produce out of your life. And there's something about getting hungry and saying, God, I'm going to cry out for the fire. A hungry person that is starving will always make a noise. They will not be quiet. It's not like, well, I'm hungry. I don't, know, I don't know about you, but if you ever fasted 40 days liquid or something like that, I'm telling you by the 40th day, you're like, Jesus, you're not, even, you're not even wanting steak. You're like, Lord, bring on the meatloaf or something. Just give me anything. Just give me something. I'm hungry. How many, I mean, have you ever been, not even fasting, but you're just like, you haven't ate all day and you're just like, you go home and you're like, honey, what's for dinner? You're thinking it's going to be steak and it turns to be meatloaf. But that meatloaf was made with love. Goodness gracious. I, it's quiet in this, in, this, in, this, in this Presbyterian church. No, I'm joking. <laughs> listen, listen to me. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're hungry, you'll eat it. But, but God doesn't want to just give us some, some you know, low-class meal. No, he wants to give us the finest dining he wants to elevate us to the next place, but we got to be desperate. We got to be hungry, and we got to say, God, I want you more than I want my daily bread. And that was the temptation in the wilderness with Jesus. When, 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 when Satan came, he said, just, just be satisfied and turn these stones into bread. And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In other words, God is always releasing fresh revelation. He's always releasing new manna. And it's the word that is proceeding, that rhema word, that is going to cause us to enter into the fullness of his power. We can't live off the stale bread. But you got to ask God for it. Just lift up your hands and say, Lord, I'm hungry this morning. I want that fire. And see, God, God, will, God will meet you in the place of your desperation for him. And when you got nothing to lose, 
I mean, I don't know about you. I don't know where you come from. I know where I came from. I know what God did in my life. And when God found me at 18 years old, screwed up, messed up, broke, busted, disgusted, thought my life was over, just wanted to commit suicide and forget about it. Grew up in church. But I'll tell you something. When God got a hold of my life, I realized that there is more in Him. There is a lot more in God. And I realized that that God wanted to give me something, but I had to be hungry for it. And so I started crying out for the fire. And it wasn't a small, like, you know, Jesus, I want the fire. Lord, give me your fire. No, it was a shouting. It was a cry. Lord, I want your fire. Jesus, give me your fire. That's not a tame fire. That's a holy desperation. That's a fire that doesn't care what people think. That's a fire that doesn't care the person on the right and the left of, of me thinks because, because God's trying to get me something. And, and it, it's more. It's more. Whoo. Ha. It's more. It's more. It's more. It's more. It's more about what Jesus thinks than about what people think. Because I'm telling you right now, those people aren't going to stand there with you in eternity. They're not going to be there with you when you're standing before that judgment seat. And, and the enemy's accusing you of this and that. I'm telling you, it's the fire of God that keeps you burning. It's the fire of God that melts off stuff that when it, the enemy comes to try to attack you. It's the fire of God that causes you to burn a blazing trail. It's the fire of God that causes you to exceed in life and excel in life and see what God has for you. It's the fire of God. You can't do it on your own. You can't stand on your own. I'm telling you, not in this hour, not in this world, and not in this time that we're living in right now where the enemy is bringing people into such demonic manifestation and oppression. You have to have the fullness of the the Holy Ghost. You can't live in religion. You can't live in tradition. You can't live in the ways of man. You got to have the Holy Ghost and fire and you got to be baptized in it. So we're saying, Lord, we want your fire. And I remember when I started crying out, I, I just, you know, wasn't even at church. It was in, you know, at, 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 my, at my house. Lord, Send your fire. I want your fire. Crying out for the fire of God. And the fire of God would come and hit me. Some days I would be so under the power of the Holy Ghost, I couldn't talk, couldn't speak for days. Eight, 12 hours in the presence of God. But I kept going back and saying, God, there's got to be more. How many are desperate this morning? How many are hungry for the presence of God? Secondly, you have to cast out lukewarmness. I recently had an encounter where I was awake, and I don't know, I, it's been something happening to me where I've been getting up, praying, some nights I don't even sleep, I just go through, you know, uh, all, all night, just praying, just praying. Even when people, people text, you know, because I got WhatsApp, people are awake all the time, people text me, I'm te why are they talking to me, I, texting me, asking me questions, I'm praying in the Holy Ghost, I, I don't know, there's something that's happening right now. How many are feeling it? And I and I I was texting a friend of mine, and I said, "Listen, I gotta go," I, I, because I was getting caught up into some, in, into a vision. And so I put my phone down, and all of a sudden, I go into a trance and get caught into a vision. And I go through this door, and I find myself inside of a mouth. I said, "Lord, where am I?" He said, "You're in my mouth." I said, Lord, what am I doing here? He said, watch and see. As I'm in the, in the mouth of the Lord, I start seeing the church. I start seeing people that are in the church. And I start seeing all kinds of crazy iniquity and sin that's happening. People trying to hide their sin. Secret sin. And the Lord keeps mercy, uh, mer uh, sending His mercy and his grace. And people wouldn't repent. They just kept living the way they wanted to live. 
And as I'm seeing this, all of a sudden, I see out of the mouth of the Lord, a sword comes out of his mouth and divides those that are living righteously from those that are living a life of secret sin and iniquity. And the Lord ejects the people out of his mouth that were living in iniquity, that were living and justifying their sin. And I said, Lord, what is this? He said, because there have been some in my body that have refused to receive John 3.16, I am going to give them Revelation 3.16. Turn with me to Revelation 3.16. Revelations 3.16 says, So then because thou art lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. Verse 17 says, Because thou art rich, uh, thou say, I am rich and increased in goods and need of Knowest not the wicked, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy gold that is tried by the fire, that thou mayest be rich with and white raiment, and thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with the eye salve, that thou may see. Notice that he talking of, he's talking again about the eyes here. The eyes are being highlighted again. Because the Lord wants to give us those seven eyes. But they only flow through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And they're only given, they're only given when that oil is poured out. How many are following me this morning? Ooh. Shatarekete. Hallelujah. Now, in Revelation 2, the Lord's 2, verse 7, the Word of God says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To him that overcomes, I would give him a tree of life in the paradise of God. God wants to give us that tree of life. He wants to give to us, even according to Revelation 2 verse 17 he says he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit is saying to the church to him that overcomes I will give him to eat the hidden manna or that's fresh revelation and I will give him a white stone and in that stone a new name written on it which no man knows save he, re- he him that receives it the name that's written on that stone is the names of Jesus The names of Jesus are what's written inside that stone. He is our justification. He is our righteousness. You can go through the entirety of the names of God and written in the name of the Christ encapsulates every one of those names. And so the Lord is saying here, those that overcome in this hour, he is going to give unto them that stone that brings the justification, and they're going to walk in righteousness. They're not going to be in lukewarmness. They're going to be set on fire. And those that refuse to be burning hot, listen to me, it's not a time to be lukewarm. Now is the time to be burning on fire for the things of God. Come on, somebody. This is an hour that you cannot, you cannot be in a place of still lukewarmness and not is seeking the face of God on a daily basis. You have to have your own personal relationship with the Lord. And when you come to the church, you're not coming just to necessarily receive something. You're coming to release something. You're coming into the corporate gathering and you're recognizing that you are not here just to, you know, just to hear another sermon, but you've been cultivating all week long the messages in your spirit, man. So then when the pa- when pastor gets up, when the apostolic anointing is flowing, The words that are being released are confirmation to you because God has been speaking to you all week. And you're going after the service. You're going, Pastor, you're not going to believe this. God's been speaking to me the same thing. Why? Because God doesn't speak two messages. He only speaks one. And everything that comes forth, if you're hearing from him, 
is going to be confirmation that's coming from this, this pulpit. Because the five-fold ministry and the purpose of the five-fold ministry is, for, is to build up the saints of God for the work of the ministry until they come into a perfect man. What Christ did was a perfect work. And so the renewal of your mind begins to be manifested and you begin to recognize what God has done. And as you're seeking Him on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, God begins to bring the renewal of your soul and your mind. Those pieces that are fragmented begin to be healed. And as a result of that, when the minister is ministering, you go, my goodness, God's been speaking to me the same thing. That doesn't happen to a lukewarm Christian. That happens to somebody that's set on fire. Say, I'm on fire for him. Number three, got to pay the price for revival. Revival is a price. And you got to pay that price. Revival does not come uh, just simply because we, you know, it sovereignly just happens. No, there has been someone that has labored in the secret place. And as a result of them laboring in the secret place, God begins to pour out His Spirit. I don't know if you've ever studied revival before. I mean, not just like a local revival, but historical revivals. And if you look at them, they all kind of start the same way. The Hebrides revival is a good example. Duncan Campbell was not in the Hebrides in Scotland. Two women, one of them was blind. Two old women, one of them was blind. Praying and crying out to God every single day for a move of God in the Hebrides. Why would God move on a little island in Scotland? Doesn't make any sense. But there were two ladies that were there, mothers of the church, that constantly were crying out to God. Constantly crying out to the Lord. Duncan Campbell wasn't even there, but the Lord spoke to him and said, come to the, come to the, uh, the Hebrides. Go to the Hebrides and preach. He got there and he realized that what God began to pour out because he, he preached in one night and the power of God fell across the entire island. People started running to the church. They left the dance halls and the places of alcohol that they were at and the Spirit of God began to be poured out so strongly that, that he had to greet them up to 2 o'clock in the morning because there was uh, even young men on their faces in the ground weeping. Not because of his preaching, but because of the presence of two women that had been praying. That decided to step in the gap and say, God, I want you to remove the iniquity of the land. And I am going to pray until the power and the presence of God comes. Revival will cost you a, a price. It will cost you sleep at night. It will cost you a meal. Because you'll say, God, I'm more hungry for you than I am uh, for my daily bread. God, I want you more than I want anything else. It will cost you friends because they'll think you're crazy. Why are you so, so fanatic now? I can't help it. Something got a hold of me. It's, it's captured me, and now I'm running after it. It's like the Song of Solomon says, when the, when, when the lover came to the door and released the fragrance, the Bible says that, the, that, that, that the bride got up in the middle of the night and ran into the streets looking for her. the lover. I'm telling you, when God gets a hold of your heart, you'll burn for him and nothing else. When God gets a hold of you, you'll say, God, I cannot live in a place of lukewarmness. God, I got to have your fire and I'm willing to pay the price. I don't care if I got to run until I find you. I'm not going to let go of you. I'm desperate for you. I want you. Number four, you got to stir up the gifts. Say, stir it up. Well, I don't feel it this morning. Well, stir it up then. Second Timothy speaks of, in, in verse 1, verse 6, talks about a heritage that Timothy had that was, that was, that was from his uh, grandmother and his mother and now was in him. And Paul saw it and it was an impartation. He said, stir up that gift of God that was given to you by the laying on of my hands. Impartation matters. The house that you're, that you're a part of matters. And that fire matters. And sometimes you may not even feel it, but the Lord will say, where are you going to stir it up? Whew. Sometimes you might not feel it, 
but you got to stir it up. Touch your neighbor and say, stir it up this morning. You got to stir it up. You got to stir yourself to the fire. You got to, you know, in a fire, when a fire is, 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 you know, it's been burning bright all night and you wake up in the morning. I don't know if you've ever gone camping before, but you'll wake up in the morning and it'll be like only the embers are left. It even looked like the fire's gone out, but really you just need to stick a poker in there, move the coals around, and then put a fresh log on there. That's called stirring it up. You stir it up. Sometimes you might not feel it, but the embers are there. All you got to do is just poke that thing in the Holy Ghost. That's why God will send a prophet. He'll just start poking you. He'll start poking to see if there's any fire in there. Say, stir it up. Then, number five, you got to break down religious. You ready for this? Religious atmospheres. You got to break down religious atmospheres and old wineskins. Because God didn't call you to a religious atmosphere, He called you to a heavenly one. And the fire of God will come on you. And what you have to do in the realm of the Spirit is build a throne for the King. Psalm 22, uh, verse 3. God rides on the praises of His people. you got to build the throne for the King. You know, when, a, it, when somebody that is in power walks in, especially during ancient times, if a king was to walk in here, we would all stand. My question is, is are we so sensitive to know that when God walks into the room, when he walks in, do we recognize? Do we recognize it? Oftentimes we're just sitting back, and I understand that, you know, we're soaking and stuff, but I'm telling you, when the presence of God comes in, you feel it, and it causes you to stand at attention because you recognize the king is in the room. God has called you to build a throne for the king through worship. Hallelujah. And you can't worship silently. To build a throne, when a king comes in, you stand at attention. When a king comes in, there is, you, there's, a, there's an atmospheric shift in you. And if you're sensitive, you'll recognize it. And when you recognize it, you, you go, whoa, the king's here. How many have ever been in an atmosphere where you go, whoa, the king's here? And you can cultivate that. You can cultivate it. You can build a throne for the king. And the cloud of his presence must be cultivated. Listen, God, just like a natural cloud, just like a natural cloud can have rain inside of it. It could be full of rain. It could come and rest over, uh, over an area. That cloud could be completely full of rain. But it isn't until there's an atmospheric shift or pressure placed upon that cloud that what's inside of it begins to flow out. It's the same way in the realm of the Spirit. You could be praying, 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 and filling that cloud with blessing. But it isn't until you come into the corporate gathering that you place pressure upon that cloud, and what's on the inside of that cloud begins to pour out. The more that you cultivate and you create an atmosphere where the cloud is able to come and the, the, and, and the cloud of the Spirit receives the incense of prayers, that cloud will be filled up so that when you come together corporately, it will begin to rain on everyone, even the, uh, the just and the... That's right, even people that aren't even in the kingdom yet. People that are not born again. That the enemy wants to kill, steal, and destroy them through drugs, through prostitution, through all kinds. Name it. Think about it. Through all the avenues of the enemy. God will use you by your prayer life to cultivate the clouds so that when you come together corporately, it doesn't just rain in this place. It rains over the whole region. 
And you start to see people that were drug addicted, those that were, that were, let's not even talk about drug addiction. Let's talk about people that are super wealthy and think that they have everything. They'll suddenly wake up one morning and realize that they have nothing because they can't take their wealth with them. And the conviction of the Holy Spirit will come upon them. And they'll, you'll, and they'll run into places like this and say, what must I do to be saved? I'm telling you, we're going to see some of the wealthiest people in the planet are going to give their life to the Lord in this hour. Not just the down and out, but the most elite wealthiest people. Because God is going to bring his holy conviction upon them because there are people that are praying in the earth and all of a sudden they're going to wake up and say, my God, I'm going to go to hell if I don't give my life to the Lord. And that comes through cultivating a cloud of his presence and that cloud must be cultivated. And a spiritual atmosphere must be preserved. Let me say this to you this morning. It is not Pastor Matt and Pastor Jess's responsibility to ne- to always preserve the spiritual atmosphere of this place they will but listen to me it is also our responsibility if this is our house to say god I'm not going to just sit here and allow an atmosphere to be the way it is. No, Lord, I, I, I'm a part of this body, and I've been, I've been in the presence of God all week long, and I'm going to come and stir it up. I don't care if, 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 if Sister Wet Eye doesn't want to cry this morning. I'm telling you what, I'm going to stir myself to a place. I'm going to get hungry for the presence of God. I'm going to be set on fire. I'm going to shout pastor down when he's preaching. I'm going to go after the things of God because what he's saying is is. Is, is literally what I've been feeling all week because I've been praying. So you got to begin to recognize where God's called you. You got to begin to recognize why, why you're here. God could have sent you, put you anywhere in the earth, but He sent you here. There's a purpose. And it's not just to fill a seat. But it's to cultivate and preserve a spiritual atmosphere. We should be going from glory to glory to glory to glory to glory to glory. And you create the culture. Touch your neighbor and say, you create it. Yeah, you create the spiritual atmosphere, the climate. You create the atmosphere. And what you decide the atmosphere is going to be like is how much God is going to pour out. We say, no, 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 God can come sovereignly and do whatever he wants. No, my friend, God is not going to override you. No, the Holy Spirit's a gentleman. He's not going to come on you like a devil. A devil will just come on and just seize you. No, the Holy Spirit is not like that. The Holy Spirit will come and he'll woo you to himself. And he'll say, come a little closer. Come a little closer. And the more that you get in the fire, you'll look back and you'll say, my goodness, look where God has brought me. I didn't even believe that uh, 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 six months, eight months ago. I, but I don't even know that person from here because you transformed me so much by your spirit and your power. And I'll tell you, sometimes the Holy Spirit isn't like a dove. Sometimes he's like a wild goose. This, the Celtic saints of, of Scotland and Wales and, 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 and of Ireland used to call the Holy Spirit a wild goose. Why? Because they, they noticed that it was impossible to catch a goose. Even when you chase it. The move of God is like a wild goose sometimes. You'll be chasing it and you'll see where God has brought you from that place to this place. And you'll say, goodness, I don't even recognize that person anymore because I'm so on fire for him. And the whole time you're preserving that atmosphere and you're growing in him. Listen, if you're in the same place that you were at back in 1986 when you were baptized in the Holy Spirit, my friend, it's time to catch that fire and get a renewal, get in his presence and say, God, what are you doing today? Because in 1986 I felt your fire, but God, there's been something that's been going on with me and I don't feel it anymore. Are you following me this morning? And a spiritual atmosphere must be released. Say release. Taking one more passage this morning. Are you 
you okay? Just got some things for you. Is this good? Ecclesiastes. Verse 3. A spiritual atmosphere must be released. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. If clouds be full of rain, they will empty themselves upon the earth. And if a tree falls towards the south or towards the north, in that place the tree falls, there it shall be. In other words, there's many things that, 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 that this uh, a verse is, is implying. Firstly, that the cloud, not just in the natural but in the spirit, if there's full of rain and we've cultivated the atmosphere, it'll begin to rain and it'll dump on the place that has, that has been cultivating it. That, you ever heard of um, uh, you ever heard of isolated showers? That means when it's raining in one place, you you it's raining in this one specific area, but it's not raining in another area. That's called that's called <laughs> that's called isolated showers. I don't know. I grew up in the south, so uh, it's so you know I moved down to the south when I was like thirteen, and I heard this term when I was down there. They said it's raining cats and dogs. Hey, do you do you guys say that? Do you say okay? Well, it's a universal term of Americans, anyways. I've never seen it raining cats and dogs, but what they're implying is that it's really cooling down. And then, if it's isolated showers, what will happen is you'll call your friend and you'll say, "My goodness," you know, like if you live in the South, you'll be like, "My goodness, it's raining over here like cats and dogs." And then the person on the other side will say, "Well, no, Cephas." It's dry as a bone over here. And, and, what, and, and they'll say, well, no, it's raining cats and dogs over here. And, and, you know, I've never seen it rain cats and dogs. But what they're implying is that it's pouring rain. And it's the same way in the Spirit. That's why when the Spirit of God begins to be poured out upon you, people won't understand it. Because oftentimes it's isolated showers. And they'll say, what on earth is happening to them? Well, that's just a doubt. That's just that just means that the heavens open and they're in the in the in the flood is hitting their life a blessing. And you're just you don't understand it because you're in a place that's dry. And God wants to set you on fire. You know, the best wood to burn is dry wood. Sometimes I'll come into a meeting, I'll look for the driest wood and just keep on just toss it on the fire and just <laughs> so a, a spiritual atmosphere must be released. In other words, what you've been putting on the inside of you, God wants to release out of you. And it takes spiritual discipline to do that. To say, God, I'm not just coming to receive, I'm coming to release. And Lord, I'm going to stir it up all week. I'm going to come into your presence. I'm going to come into your courts with thanksgiving. I'm going to come into your house with praise. Lord, I'm going to let your glory uh, be lifted up, not just on Sunday, but every day. And Lord, I'm going to begin to stir it up this year. I'm going to begin to be fired up this year. Lord God, if I was on fire last year, Lord, increase my fire. If I offended people by my fire, Lord, let them be more offended this year. Because I'm telling you, I just want to burn for you lift up your hands this morning Lord I thank you I thank you for what you brought us into I thank you for what you're going to do in even greater portion in this year Lord I thank you for that supernatural the Holy Ghost I thank you for the fire of God Lord I thank you for that stone Lord, that we're not we're not just going to look at the stone. We're not just going to look at uh, the prophetic word, uh, the, the 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 seven spirits of God, the seven radiations of the uh, of the spirit. We're going to receive it, Lord. We're going to walk in it. We're going to step into it, and Lord, we're going to cultivate it. We're going to move into it. Lord, we're going to set ourselves on fire. We're going to cast out lukewarmness. Lord, we're going to begin to stir ourselves up with the gifts of God. Lord, we thank you this morning that we're going to begin to step into everything that you called us to do. Lord, we're going to break down old wineskins, religious atmospheres, and Lord, we're going to go for the glory. Lord, you called us to this place to be to be full of your presence. People may not understand us. They may think that we're strange, but 
But I'm telling you, they thought manna was strange too. They said, what is this? But it was a meal that fed them in the wilderness. And Lord, I thank you that you're calling us to the place of, of feasting. You're calling us to the place where we begin to be so desperate for you that fresh revelation begins to pour and the presence of God begins to move. And Lord, you're lighting our path with that sevenfold radiation of the Holy Ghost. There's not one thing that, that God, that you called us to, there's not one thing that you called us to that we're not going to see. Lord, there's not one There's not one thing that's good in you that you're not going to give us, God. You said if we ask you for a fish, you're not going to give us a serpent. Lord, you said that if we ask you for bread, you're not going to give us a stone. Lord, we're asking you for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Lord, begin to stir us up every day. Woo! Every day. Every day. In Jesus' mighty name.